Hello viewers, I'm SB and welcome back to Disco Elysium where hopefully we're going to be able to talk to this lady now. Let's see if 24 hours was enough time for her computer to reboot. What is it? The woman is still hunched over the keyboard, gently illuminated by the purring machine. Uh, I didn't break anything, did I? No, you just printed out my personal lock and wasted some paper. It does not look like a big loss to her. Yeah, it doesn't sound like a waste. Uh, hey, are you the lead programmer of We're All Untethered by any chance? Yes. Or no, not anymore. That project is dead. She doesn't seem surprised to be recognized. Rather, sad. Something passes over her face before she straightens her back. How would I be able to tell? This is a terrible interview position. I should be standing, like, over here. So, it doesn't really make any sense for me to ask who are you, but what are you doing here is certainly interesting. I am Sona Lukan and Kilde, the former lead programmer of Fortress Accident and RSA radios. I have over 16 years of programming experience, and I'm proficient in both Vox and Orbis languages. If you're not here to hire me, I don't really know how can I help you. Uh, what are you doing in an abandoned church? You really like those questions, don't you? There's a hint of amusement in her tired eyes. Uh, well, you know, there have been complaints from your neighbors. I am conducting a scientific research here. You can't throw me out, she says, ready to stand her ground. What research? I'm looking for the location of a two millimeter hole in the world. She's looking for a disruption in the radio waves. That's what her personal log said. Yes, thank you, interfacing, I remember. The lieutenant raises his brows, but doesn't say anything. Is the hole connected to the data loss in your journal? Yes, that's what led me here. She stares at the burnished antenna on a nearby table. But I suspect it might be something a bit more complicated than that. A hole in the world, what does that mean exactly? Exactly, what does it mean? There's something frantic about her as she locks her gaze with you, eyes shining like pearls. Up to now it has been impossible to say what it is. Because it's impossible to measure nothing. What do you think it is? What qualities does nothing have? How do you measure something that does not exist? She's suddenly absorbed in the conversation, waiting for your answer. That's a little above your pay grade at the moment. I do not quite have the logic necessary for this conversation. Uh, I can't even understand how we're talking about something that doesn't exist, let alone measure it. You measure it by its surroundings, by that which does exist, she replies, which is what I've been trying to do. I've tried using hydrotransducers to record the silence, to find out where it begins. But honestly, it's not progressing very well. She grows silent, staring at her circle of basins. It looks like some ancient ritual. But you said that the research isn't going ver uh, very well, why not? Because it's just trial and error trying to locate the swallow, the exact point in space. And I don't have a... she stops mid-sentence. You know what, it would be really helpful if you could just stop talking and let me work. Okay, uh, that's all I wanted to know about the scary two millimeter hole in the world, for now. Uh, she has definitely seen the crab man. We could try to talk to her about it. I don't know that it matters much though, right? We're certainly not going to try to kick these people out of the cathedral. So uh, the kids are going to have to... I guess we should ask how she feels about dance music. Because <laughs> the kids can either open their uh, open their club alongside these two, or they can go to hell. How do you feel about uh, enotic dance music? What? She squints her eyes. I hate it. I bet she hasn't even heard it. Well, like, have you ever listened to it? Like, actually listened? Yeah, like all the time. My tent neighbors don't really ease up with their partying, do they? She pulls a face that looks absolutely scathing. Maybe I'd have to be on drugs to get it, but, a so but to a sober mind, it just sounds like uninspired rug whipping. No idea what it has to do with either dancing or music. Right, okay, right. But how do you feel about, like, a club or anodic dance music? This is about those speed freaks in the tent, isn't it? She looks up, shaking her head. I've got some news for you. It's not a nightclub they want to build here. No, I know. I... Raphael hasn't caught up, but I'm aware. What do they want to build, then? Gee, I can't imagine. Take a guess, why don't you? 
Um, I'm not even allowed to guess the thing that they're absolutely obviously going to do. You know, a youth center would be nice. The lead programmer sighs. I can't believe they got you so easily. Go have another talk with those up-and-coming entrepreneurs, will you? Thanks. Yeah, good luck, the lieutenant notes. I'm not coming in there. Okay, that's fair. Uh, well, we can ask why there's why there are so many machines in this place, but we kind of know already, right? I don't know that that's actually a good use of our time. Uh, I'll just let you work in peace now. So I wonder if we could go back to the other computer and use the same password to investigate the production schedule? Maybe, you know, maybe she's using that password because it's the one that she, uh, she used back at, uh, at, at Whirl. Also, I ran a little bit. I ran two steps and I feel bad about it. But I don't think there's anything else for us to do in here. I think we have a better idea of the overall shape of the problem. And we're definitely not going to just kick those people out of the church. Frankly, I'm not 100% sure how they were eating while the door was padlocked. I and mean, there must be... There must be a thing running out the back, right? Wherever that... Uh... Can we see where that stained glass window is? Where she's getting the electricity in through? Because it seemed like the cords were coming through that part of the wall, weren't they? I don't actually see any cables laid anywhere. Huh. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go back to those kids real quick and tell them what we've learned. Tell them the deal's definitely off. I'm kind of curious how they'll handle it. Make sure we're not missing anything here. No, we've been fairly thorough. That said, there's actually still more coastline to explore. We definitely need to do that. And it's actually getting into the afternoon here. Like we should probably get on it fairly soon. Actually, what did it what did it upgrade or update our quest with there? Tell Andre about Suna's thoughts on the nightclub. Okay, well, I mean we can certainly do that. Hi again. So uh how are things going? We did unlock this check again. Uh hold on. Hold on, hold on. Let me try out my logic clothes here. Uh, so we have we have a set of logic glasses. We have a logic hat. That's right, I haven't been wearing a hat this whole time. What am I losing here? Suggestion? We could probably leave that on quite a lot, actually. Let's take it off when we're going into important conversations. And then I think we have some other logic stuff. Yep, this dress shirt. It's, it's just extremely logical, is the thing. It's maybe the most logical shirt anyone has ever seen. Okay, I think that's... Yeah, that's the best we're going to be able to do. Plus three is not bad, though. Hi again. So, uh, how things going? 72%. Let's just uh, hope that we don't roll another three, or God forbid, a two. Okay. A number of things don't add up. Let's take a look here. How about gather around, kids? Okay, kids, now gather around. The young speed freak puts down a busted capacitor and looks at you. The one with the large head seems very enthusiastic about whatever you have planned. The would-be leader is less amused. He might have some sense of what's going on here. Sometime in the past, and I'm not sure when or where, but betrayal was involved, I fell sick and became the shadow you see now. But before that, I have reason to believe I was a police detective. But you still are. Uh, and I was good enough in this job to be awarded the rank of Lieutenant Yefretor. I could have been captain. Imagine that. What happened? Egghead looks serious suddenly. Disco happened. I've been trying to say we need the next step in dance, dance music to happen fast. Andre looks at his friend. Shut it. What? I have! I've said that! Now, obviously, that might as well have been a thousand years ago. But there's still some detective left in me. The young speed freak is silent. He senses something is wrong. This isn't the makings of a club. It's a tent full of laboratory equipment for manufacturing drugs. Ooh, I, have, I have no idea how you arrived at that conclusion, but it, it's wrong. Look, we even have speakers. Speaker. Singular. One speaker. They have one speaker. Thank you, sense of sight. <laughs> I'm glad that was a trivial check. Uh, 
You have no headphones. Wouldn't a cell need her headphones to spin tape? What do you know about spinning tape? Nothing. I know you pawned them, likely for lab equipment and drug ingredients. I'm, I'm sorry, but there is no lab equipment and no drug ingredients. But that nosafed right there is for the active ingredient. He, he said it was for his nose. What more do you want? The distilled water? Cornerstone of a clean lab? And, and of all cellular-based life? What's your point, lawbringer? And where is his... I'm assuming this refers to the speaker. And where is his friend? Did he lose his friend? What do you mean, friend? The other speaker. You only have one. It's a, it's a one-speaker system. It's monodynamic. You wouldn't know the first thing about sound reproduction in anodic music. Other speaker. Pfft. Well, there's no need for me to pile on any more, is there? No shit. He sounds tired. In short, you tried to use a police detective to set up a drug lab. That's... He waves his hands. Come on, come on, that's... Against the law? I'm, I meant to say not true. So, what are we gonna... I'm not, in, I'm not roping Suna into this, in case that wasn't clear. So, what are we going to do with you? What do you what do you mean by do? There's resignation in his voice. He's almost ready to drop the act. It wouldn't take a lot of pushing. Well, you can tell me what's really going on and we'll work from there. I can be lenient. Or maybe I should Yeah, maybe I should lean in. This is not really the way that we've been running the character so far, but we have here a moment of triumph, and this being a police officer thing has mostly been a real goddamn nightmare. But we have an opportunity here. To use it as a resource to gain something. I'm leaning in. We do this lawman style. First you tell me everything. Then I pass judgment. Or else? There is an audible clank as he lets his a wrench drop into his toolbox. Uh no, I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm not gonna say this part. Or else I'll call back up and haul you all off to the pen, for starters. Okay, man, okay. He raises his hands. Th things are just so, so hard for an entrepreneur in this city right now. It's not like we lied when we said we want to turn the church into the wickedest club in East Revishal. Because we do, we totally do. We just need to turn it into a speed lab first. You know, to get our foot in the door. And why did you need me? Well, like I told you, spooky assholes moved in while I was getting all this stuff together. A month ago the place was empty and now it's all spooked up. Yeah, but they're not really spooky, are they? Actually, the dude who crawls around the rafters is like a little spooky. No, man, they're spooky, all right. It's just that they would probably also call the police if we started cooking speed in there. But the sign was way off, too. I couldn't feel the love at all. Whatever you think is right, sir, but please, we were only trying to make a living. Well, I could arrest them. This is actually an interesting choice. We could arrest them, we could demand a bribe, I'm not going to demand a bribe. Uh, I don't want these kids feeling like they have any power in this situation here, frankly. So we could arrest them, we could just tell them to get lost and keep their noses clean. We could tell them that it's okay to proceed with the club as long as there's no drugs, but I don't think that that's gonna... I don't think that that's gonna work. Uh, the Asuna is not gonna be into that, and I think what she's doing is maybe a thing that our character's like very interested in. There's a tinge of cryptidness to it, or at least, uh, you know, a similar sort of logic that he would find fascinating. I'm just gonna run him off. Here's the thing. We leaned into the authority thing, but I still feel like our character doesn't really think of himself as an authority on anything, not, you know, post-breakdown. So, let's just run these kids off. We'll, uh, confiscate some of their gear here so it would be hard for them to set up a drug lab elsewhere. Yeah, that should be fine. Get lost. I don't want to see you again. No, please! Egghead presses stop on the tape player. In the silence, you can hear the wind howl outside. It didn't actually... it didn't actually stop. There needs to be a club for anodic music in there. Everyone hates each other. Everybody hates it here. It's all just drugs and we're slaves and I... I can't... We're running out of time! Without his smile, Egghead looks heartbroken. And older than you thought he was. He looks almost as old as you. We need a win. I promise, this will be a win. We won't cook speed in there. We'll do it clean. We'll do it true. 
We'll do it sober and real and beautiful. This will be a victory for the light. Man. I feel bad for him. I do legitimately feel bad for him. I... I think that our character would view the work that Suna is doing as too important. No debate. Get lost. I'm not letting some druggies take over a church. The would-be leader looks beat. Okay, he nods. Pack it up, Egg. The young man closes his toolbox. Alright, <laughs> you're getting off easy. I didn't murder the shit out of you. No, no, you should be glad. I'm not even arresting you. He doesn't even look at you. Can I please turn off the damn speaker? No? No, I actually can't. Okay, fair enough. So... That was a resolution. Probably that means a cell is gone. I'm assuming she went with them, which means we'll never be able to pass that empathy check, which I'm a little sad about because I did want to see what would happen. Uh, we do have a skill point, and I think we're going to do with it exactly what I said we were going to do with it. Open this up and uh, and work on the wasteland of reality. Hopefully we won't need our physical instrument skill for a while. We're going to kick it, though, man. This is part of our recovery. To some degree, uh, falling into all of this cryptid stuff is probably also part of our recovery. It's a, sort of a coping mechanism. Uh, so should we go back to Suna and tell her... I, I may as well, right? Tell her that we dealt with that. Maybe she'll be a little bit friendlier. We ran, we ran off those kids and their music will stop... Uh, not being a problem for your tests, although she did manage to isolate the loop, so I guess it doesn't really even matter to her. But still, she might be glad they're not here anymore. Okay, we are not running in the church. I am being respectful and everything. Yes, what is it? Uh, those ravers won't be bothering you anymore. I told them to leave because they were planning a drug trade. You told them to leave. She looks up, surprised. Didn't think the cops in this place had it in them. Uh, so... Let's talk to her a little bit more. Why are there so many machines in this place? Explain to me your methodology. I brought them here. These are my machines. Please don't touch anything. Uh, well, why do you need an antenna? I use the AR-1 as my Ream Prefect processing unit. Ream Prefect, that's your radio computer, right? Mm-hmm. And that antenna is its processing unit? Yes, she sighs. You really don't know anything about radio computers, do you? She has stopped working now. Uh, I know a little. Alright, well, all radio computers perform operations up on air, so in order to gain more processing power, you need to invest in a good antenna. Wait, what's on air? How do they, how these things actually work? On the front. The unified front of radio waves, licensed and controlled by Lintel in the East Insulindic region. It's all around us, she waves her hand. That's what on air means. Like love, I guess. And the AR-1, is it a good antenna? She stops to think. I guess it is. So far I've been quite satisfied with it. Martinez is an unstable region with bad coverage, and the operation has been surprisingly stable. But it's not the cheapest one on the market, so I wouldn't recommend it for your regular red tape operations. Frasier 1000 is a foolproof line for civilians. Anyway, she turns back to her terminal. You should do some research before you decide to buy anything. Ask around, compare prices. There are many milieus dedicated to that sort of thing. You know, spend some time on Newegg. She liked telling you this. It calmed her nerves. Yeah, I'm right there with her. Um, so what are you doing with your radio computer? I'm working. The machine seems almost alien with its pulsing core, the light casting her face in a strange shadow. Working on what? Could you... She closes her eyes. Could you Could you just, like, shh for a moment? Or get to the point. I really need to focus on something. It's not just rudeness. It really is hard to concentrate on whatever she needs to do, and you're not helping. Right, I'll, I'll just... I'll buzz off for a while. We'll come back. Okay, and I will not run in your lab space, which is also a church. Well, you know, we resolved something here. I feel like this is maybe the most thoroughly we've solved a situation. Ah, the body. We were pretty good with the body. 
but it does feel like we're accomplishing things. And I kind of like, I, I kind of like that it took so long for us to like really accomplish very much. We spent the first couple of days of game time mostly just like having breakdowns and stress vomiting. And so that makes it all the more impressive and important feeling when we're actually getting things done. It's cool. I don't know if it's clear to you yet. I'm enjoying this game a great deal. Let's have a look at this streetlight. A dead phone. Oh, there's a payphone. A smashed receiver. Like someone hung up too hard. Like way too hard. What about this one? That's the wrong way. Someone must have worked hard to smash that plastic dome. Yeah, it's way up there. And here we have a metal payphone under a yellow plastic dome. You could use it to call someone, unless you're out of change. Uh, <laughs> just dial a random number? Yeah, sure, why not? Calling. Still calling. This feels wrong. Should you be doing this? End of tone. Someone picks up. Pierre? Is that you, Pierre? The voice is female and sounds about a hundred years old. Oh no. Oh no, we're going to break this poor woman's heart. Uh, no, this is not Pierre. Do you have any news about Pierre? Wh who is Pierre? He's my sister's grandson. He used to visit me as a lad. Fine young man. But who are you then? A salesman of some sort? Modern goods are rubbish, and I can't afford them anyhow. It's a shame what you did to our country. The woman moans, and the phone lines howl in unison with her. Um, no, I'm a, uh, I was just calling a random number, and you somehow ran with it? This is because we are bread leaders. I can hear the common or mixed background from your voice. Just wanted it to be Pierre. Have a pleasant evening, prankster. Okay, let's maybe not do that again. That was actually a real downer. There's still quite a bit of uh, of coast for us to move up here, right? Like if we look at our um, if we look at our map, yeah, we're approximately right there. There's still all of this beyond the bunker, and I'm very interested. And in also, I wonder if we can actually reach that. Hmm. But up here is where I would expect we would see the cryptozoologist, right? So. All right. Uh, what do we have up here? We have some clothing, maybe. Someone has left an unidentifiable article of clothing on this railing. It smells really bad. Let's take a closer look. It's streaked with dried seagull shit and tangled with pieces of seaweed. A dangling arm suggests there might be a jacket beneath the crust of filth. It seems likely that it was left in the surf until someone laid it out on this bench to dry out. Unfortunately, that just seems to have stiffened it into a shapeless mass. Please tell me you're not taking that with you. It might be a clue, Kim. A clue. You think our suspect is a seagull who's been defecating on unsuspecting jackets? Well, no. Me neither. You should still take it, though. I mean, I'm definitely going to, right? <laughs> We're certainly going to take it. Who knows if we'll ever get anything useful out of it. It's probably not even the worst smelling possession that I have here. Okay, even more money and even more orbs to click on. You know how I feel about that. Okay, just a bunch of garbage everywhere. What is this? There's a box over there to play with, too. A makeshift roof. Vagrants have tried to make the boardwalk habitable. The tarp will keep out neither rain nor snow nor wind. Yeah, it doesn't really seem to be anchored very well. A coin-operating weighing machine. Hasn't been used for a decade. Vagrants have recently painted the tarp red. Water drips from it. And over here, Mega Binos Prescription Lenses. Wow, plus two encyclopedia, huh? Discover your inner bino. Whose idiotic idea were square and beige plastic frames, anyway? Beige is a color that does not look good on anyone. Not to mention that seeing the world through these exceedingly thick lenses feels almost nauseating. Nausea-inducing hell glasses. This filthy rag has been at the mercy of the elements for quite some time. It's streaked with seagull shit and abnormally stiff from god knows what natural processes. I can't even tell what brand it is. We're going to investigate that, but probably not right now. Um, it's like 5 p.m., and we still have a lot of stuff to do today. Like, I definitely want to go back to the doomed commercial area before the end of the day, so let's let's maybe get a move on here. 
A big wine canister. It's open and empty. No, 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 no. Moonshine, probably. Smells like tasty fermentation. I am resisting. This is the official sound of me not getting into the moonshine. Oh, wait, I have all kinds of thoughts right now. The smell. It's awful and familiar. Hold on, that is awful. It doesn't help. You can still smell it. What is it? Don't you recognize it? That hideous pungency? That faintly cloying sweetness? Only death smells like that. Something cold wakes in the pit of your stomach. Fear. It is death. It must be. Well, heads up, Lieutenant. Something's not right here. Is that... I assumed that that was just some guy who was maybe drunk. Maybe he's dead. The Lieutenant has already brought a handkerchief to his nose. Careful there. These floorboards look rotten and weak. Yeah, that guy's probably dead, huh? He's not paying attention at all. There's some tear, an empty cigarette package, and a crumpled kebab wrapper in the trash, kit. Well, trash bin. Well, obviously, give me this stuff. Two empty bottles of Tallulah vodka and a can of black potent porter is all you find. No, wait, there's more in there. Livis strawberry liquor, plus some Pilsner bottles, too. Better not pick them up. They seem unhygienic. A tragedy. The lieutenant looks in the can, eyes watering from the smell. He shakes his head with genuine sadness. Let's uh, examine the cigarette package. Whoever tossed it here was a heavy smoker. The brand name reads Red Astra. Examine the kebab wrapper. You see traces of mayonnaise and ketchup on it, as well as a tomato wedge. The wrapper reads Shish Kebab Revishal. It's no older than a day, maybe two, no mold yet. It's hard to concentrate in the smell. Sea air brings some relief. All right, let's... Hold on, I'm gonna look at this too. This coin-operated viewer has been out of order for years. Stop messing with the coin viewer and hold on to something. The wind is so strong. It's... What? No. The wind is not that strong. Alright. A man lies on the boardwalk, his limbs bent and neck turned at an unnatural angle. Right next to him is an empty bottle of spirits. In his cramped hand, a chewing gum wrapper. And he's called Working Class Corpse. That's not a great sign. The smell is not as bad as a two-week-old corpse, but it's definitely heading there. Hold on. The lieutenant squats next to the corpse and examines his face. Two bulging eyes stare back at him, void of any signs of life. The vividity is faintly pronounced. Whoever this, this is, he's been dead for two days, no longer. He stands up and shivers as a gust of wind blows through his bomber jacket. We need to investigate. Calm now. Carefully. Just another day, just another dead body. Breathe. Okay, let's start with the surroundings. There's some dried blood on the metal bench, right where the corpse's head rests. Floorboards are rotten and slippery around the hole. An empty bottle lies nearby. A chewing gum wrapper is clutched in his fist. Be very, very careful where you step here. Yeah, so I'm thinking right now, preliminary, maybe he was just drinking. He stepped... The board gave way, he fell and just cracked his head. Let's, uh, let's look at his head. A dry chunk of blood covers the hair at the back of his head. An open wound. It's sticky and cold to your touch. This is what killed him. <laughs> Thank you. I don't see any other major wounds, do you? Hard to say. Seems like the head wound was fatal. It's exactly the shape of the bench. Let's check the floorboards here. They screech under your feet ominously. It's hard to say whether the dead man's weight was what caused the boardwalk to break. It definitely looks fragile. You see waves churning below. Something cracks beneath your feet. He could have easily disappeared into the sea through that hole and you never would have found him. Let's have a look at the bottle. A three-quarter liter Tallulah vodka with its cap missing. There's hardly anything left inside. Tear all around us. He looks, at the other, uh, he looks at two other bottles near the coin-operated viewer, then at your yellow plastic bag. I'd prefer if you didn't collect them this time. It's not proper. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, what about this chewing gum wrapper? Rubowski Spearmint Chewing Gum. Green leaves on the cover. The man's mouth is half agape from the terror of the fall. So we look in. The blackness of death. Stench. You think you see white chewing gum, too. Confirmed. Nearly the whole pack is there, solidified on his lower rear teeth. That's weird. 
He ate the whole pack, right? Just to cover the smell of alcohol before going home. The worst thing is... The man shudders from the cold. I've seen it before. Almost the same scenario. Even the chewing gum. It's always the same. The entire boardwalk creaks in the wind as you take a step back. Alright, let's look at his clothes here. He's wearing mud-caked boots, beige trousers, and an old brown leather jacket with a bright blue lining. There are traces of kebab sauce on his chest. The leather jacket suits him well. It must be custom made. Cool leather jacket with a bolt of blue. Oh no, this sounds terribly familiar. Now well, search his pockets. He finds some sunflower seeds and a rain-soaked library card folded into two. His jacket feels sodden and heavy under your hand. Good, we should take a look at that library card after this is done. Now the man himself. The man has fallen through a crack in the boardwalk and hit his head against the metal bench. Coagulated blood covers his black hair. One of his feet is still tangling through the hole. A bad fall. Might have been dark outside? This place is a minefield in the dark. Examine his face. His expression is dull like the sea behind him. Drops of water shining on his mustache. His eyes, empty and wide, look frightening in their frozen gaze. Height, 170 to 175 centimeters, curly hair, stout build, age approximately 50 to 60 years. He was confused when he died. Confused and alone, most likely. Overcome with the awful surprise of it all. That's what the chewing gum seems to point to as well. Well, what do you think happened here, Kim? Death by misadventure. He slipped and fell through the boardwalk. A truly unfortunate accident. If it wouldn't have been for that bench, he'd be alive. Now you reckon he was drunk? Oh, yes. The lieutenant nods. What about alcohol poisoning? Liver failure? Some symptoms of acute alcohol poisoning could definitely have played a role here. Severe confusion, respiratory depression, unpredictable behavior. But I think the death arrived through head trauma, not liver failure. Yeah, that seems pretty much, uh, pretty much right. Probably not related to the lynching. What about the kebab? What about it? The deceased ate some kebab. He shrugs. It's probably from a nearby place. Maybe in the pox? Eh, sometimes a kebab is just a kebab. Well, uh, someone should be held responsible for this broken boardwalk. It's dangerous. They'll seal this place off after the news reaches the coalition officials. I doubt they have enough resources to actually repair the boardwalk. Not that sealing it off would keep anyone away. All it does is keep the city council's hands clean. He smiles sourly. Right. Does seem to be a pretty straightforward misadventure. Though there's still the question of identifying the body. Well, I think we have some ideas there. So who is this man? Looks like one of the locals. You'd have to know this spot to come here. You don't just walk over here, although we absolutely did. But that's just a lazy assumption. What do you think? A dead working class man with a bottle in his hand. Don't deceive yourself. You know who this is. Yes, we do. It's the working class woman's missing husband, dead on the boardwalk. The woman you met at the book stand. He looks at the bundle of flesh and rags laying on the ground. Why do you think it's her husband? Well, the leather jacket matches her description perfectly. The bright blue lining. He nods, then points at the ring on the man's left hand. Well, he's definitely someone's husband. So what should we do with him? From where I stand, I, see, I can see two options. We either take the case and follow the leads to identify the body on our own, or we report back to the station and leave this for our colleagues. I mean, we found him, we should finish this. Alright, we should first examine the library card you found, then we can call the station from my Kanima let them know we're taking the case. That does seem to be the thing to do here. It's 5.15. This probably... this is probably more important. Alright, the cover bears the stamp of the Jamrock Public Library. The library card is folded into two and still slightly wet to the touch. The front side reads, Central Jamrock Public Library card issued to Billy Mijon, expires July 53. Billy is a unisex name. Could be the deceased or a family member. Not look inside. Let's see if there's a picture or anything. I can't imagine, but who knows. 
Whoever owns this card is an avid reader. You find a list of books written in blue pencil. Radio Thriller, Stand a Little Less Between Me and the Sun. The last one in the list is The Glinting Curve by M. Tybalt. A library stamp indicates that the book has been returned. Most of these titles seem to be in the sci-fi genre. Some thrillers, too. This is pretty, um, not my understanding of how a library card works. Let's look at the backside of it. If lost, please return the card to the library, dial a number, or visit us, Marrow Street 78, Jamrock. Business hours, 09 to 18. Good, he takes a note. We should give them a call from my Kanima, uh, see if we can learn anything about Billy Mijan. Yeah, I guess that's the way we're doing this. Alright, well... We should also, while we're here... Not that I'm not trying to treat this body as an important thing, because obviously it's an important thing, but we should probably, like, um, also just walk down the, uh, the coast a little bit more, you know? So who knows when the next time we'll be back over here is. It probably will not be today. Okay. Further north. So there's this. We know we're not ready to mess with this yet. Make sure that we're holding tab periodically for any sneaky objects that are interactable. Wait, did I have a thought? Oh, you know what? That was just me holding tab. Is this really not a thing? It sure looks like it would be a thing. Okay, we got some stuff up here. Cigarette butts cleaned away under a rock. Grand Timotiri? We take a mental note. Tio Mutiri. Seems important somehow. That was a blue orb, too, which is interesting. That means I... Emotionally, I feel that it's important, not, like, logically. Someone's made a campfire here a long time ago. A rusted, broken control box for the radio relay tower. This ladder is too rusty to climb. The sea, aware, the sea air has eaten away at it. This relay tower coordinates, bo or coordinates boat traffic in the bay. Barely. Yeah, it does not look like it's in great shape. What is this? Tiny inlets there, off in the far distance where the posts trail toward. Was that the sound of... Huh. I thought for a second there this thing was going to tip over on us. A scented scarf. Even more reduction in physical instrument. You know, in case we needed that. So, no cryptozoologists here. You know, maybe they ended up uh, across the bay? Or maybe they ended up inside this thing? What was this check again? Interfacing. A very, very large interfacing check. Right. Okay, well, we're not getting through that without gaining some bonuses somehow. I mean, hold on. If I... If I equip the pry bar, oh, sorry, tools, the, cry, the pry bar in my hand, do I get a bonus on this at all? Is this a, a pry bar-able task? No, I do not. Okay. Well, I'm just going to put my flashlight back in here, because at this point, this is my lucky flashlight, and I feel very uncomfortable when I'm not holding it. All right, let's head back over toward the other side of... Uh, of the water lock, because we have some unfortunate news to probably deliver. First, investigate fully, but then deliver. And how do we get back? Can we go this way? Oh, hey, there's some stuff on the ground that I did not notice before. A fair amount of money, in fact. Yeah, we're actually, like, really doing well on cash here. Obviously, we can't... Uh, <laughs> We cannot hope, it would be too much to hope, for this to continue, because at this point we've explored a lot of the stuff over here. We're not going to find huge amounts of cash again. Wait, did that... Oh no, that's the woman. Hold on, what is this? Oh, it's the door into that room. Is it? Wait, what is that? No, it's like a box. A box that makes a lock jingling noise, huh? Okay. Well, let's not get too distracted. I'm really bummed out about this, man. The lady does not... What? 
creaking ahead, a broken axle grinding. I'm not going to get stuck on the wrong side of the waterlock, am I? Wait, did we attempt to interact with this building at all? No, hold on, there's like stuff over here. There's stuff I totally missed over here. Uh, I mean, maybe it's not appropriate to be doing this right now. Maybe we have a more important thing to be doing. And never mind, we can't get over here anyway. Alright, let's hurry back across. We should probably... Just swing through the pawn shop, you know, while, while we're on our way in, right? Why not? In case he's got anything new. Also, uh, probably worth looking at the figurine cabinet to see if there are any other figurines that we feel we should buy. Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah, right, I unlocked the Kuno Empathy check because I put a point in Empathy. That's not that interesting, actually. Uh, inspect the Knights on Horseback. Okay, I don't actually have the option of buying any of these, right? Yeah, okay. Any new dialogue with you? Hello, hello. Let me know if I can help you with anything. Okay. Never mind. Nothing new. Nobody ever pawns anything. I mean, I guess we've only been here a couple of days. It's probably not that crazy for a pawn shop in a community of this size to not get any things in two days. Alright, Silang might have some tapes, we were told. I'm not gonna bother. I changed my mind, now I feel it's very important to get on this stuff right away. Alright, let's, um, pull out the radio. I need to report a dead body on the Martinez boardwalk. One moment, you can hear her shuffling through some papers. Can you please describe the body? Age, sex, cause of death. Yeah, an unidentified middle-aged man, height 170 to 175, dark hair, medium build, looks like he slipped, fell through a hole in the boardwalk, and hit his head against a metal bench. We suspect he might have been inebriated when he fell. There were bottles all around him, and traces of vomit on his shirt. Any signs of violence? No, no, it seems like it was just a very sad accident. No field autopsy necessary, she repeats. You can hear her quickly typing in the background. What about his belongings? Did you examine his clothes? He was wearing boots, trousers, and an old leather jacket with a bright blue lining. I found a library card from his pockets. Uh, it's from the Central Jamrock Public Library. It belongs to someone named Billy Mijan. Oh good, you have a lead. Do you and Lieutenant Kitsuragi want to take the case, or should I assign it to someone else? Oh no, we got it. We're extremely good detectives. I don't know if you know this. I have assigned the case to Lieutenant Kim Kitsuragi. Please follow up on this library lead to identify the man. We'll send somebody to take the body to the morgue. Okay, well then, please connect me to the Jamrock Public Library. I've got Central Jamrock Public Library on the line, and I've already introduced you to their librarian. I'll connect in the call in two, one... Yes, this is the Central Jamrock Public Library here. A male librarian answers the call. How can I help you, officer? He sounds worried, yet ready to assist. This is how people get when the police call. I'm looking for any information you can provide on Billy Mijan, a reader? Billy. Billy Mijan, you said. Hold on, give me a second. I'll have to check our database. He puts down the receiver. Then he does it, very slowly. Uh, yes, hello, are you still there? You can hear him fiddle with the printout. I found Billy Mijan's home address. Is that alright? No phone number, unfortunately. They're too poor to have a phone line. Yeah, home address is fine. Here we go. Rue de Sinkes Lane, 33B, apartment number 20. It's in Martinez, I believe. Cape Side Apartments, it says. That's all. That's where the smoker on the balcony lives, isn't it? Wait, do you have any other information on Billy Machine? It says here they returned their last book just a few days ago, but I wasn't at work that day. And do you know someone who was? Marie? He covers the phone with his hand and yells out into the room behind him. Marie! Do you re remember a reader named Billy Mijan? They returned a Tybalt book the other day. You hear someone answer from afar. Maurice, what? A woman yells. Then, yeah, okay, if it was the police... She starts explaining something. Yes, it was my colleague Marie. The librarian is speaking into the phone again. Uh, she said that it was Billy's husband who returned the book. He also asked for this new sci-fi release... Lose Radio City 87, but we don't have it yet. 
Okay, good. We have a, you have a name now. Well, we had we have a name that we had before. So Billy Mijon is a woman, not a man. How did your colleague know it was her husband? Uh, Marie knows Billy. She's been working here longer than me. Sometimes her husband returns books for her. And then goes for a little drink later on the lookout. Do you know the husband's name? Sorry, no. Marie only knows him by sight. Well, then she can describe how he looks. Marie... A moment passes. She says it's an older man and that she's pretty sure he had a drink or two the last time she saw him. And what was he wearing? Uh, one second. Sorry, Marie wasn't really paying any attention to that. Really? Okay, well, <laughs> that's all from me. I guess I have no other questions. That's inconvenient. The librarian hangs up. The call gets redirected back to the station. Okay, uh, we don't need to talk about the boots today, right? That's a tomorrow thing. I guess I'm done with the radio for now. So, we could go talk to the woman. Or we could go try to investigate the apartment. We should probably just... Oh, she's gone. We might have to go to the apartment. Okay, well... I suppose let's do that first. That seems pretty important. I'm gonna just say a word to Kuna real quick here. Mostly I just want to see what the level of difficulty on that empathy check Kuno's is right now. Like Kuno's dad. Kuno doesn't give a fuck about anything. Okay, cool. Great for you. So, actually, with the plus empathy shoes that we have, we could get this above, a, uh, above even. We could maybe make this happen. It's not a thing that I'm going to do right this second. We'll come back. Kuno's there 100% of the time, right? Unfortunately, we do have to go all the way around here if we want to get to those apartments. I should probably be... Yeah, hitting... Hitting tab periodically, just, you know, make sure we have, uh... We haven't missed any garbage or any new garbage. Okay. So, one of these apartments up here. I guess, I, I was assuming when he said where the smoker lives, I assumed he meant up on that balcony where the smoker lives, but I guess it could just be anywhere in the building, right? Uh, are there doors that we haven't... We haven't had access to that apartment, but we also can't interact with the door, so what are you going to do? Alright, we've been in both of those. It probably is upstairs. I think there was a door upstairs that we weren't able to interact with before. I think. Or rather, that, that we could... It was highlighted as interactable, but that I didn't get any prompts for or anything. It just made that noise that it makes. So hopefully we are going to see that she is home. So otherwise, I don't know what we're going to do with this information. Yep, a weathered brown door. The number reads 20. Something smells good. Soup à l'oignon? Maybe that's how it's pronounced? Maybe? The lieutenant motions uh, for you to go ahead and knock. Hold on, Kim, we should discuss this before we move on here. What should we expect? You're right, let's talk this through. He looks at the apartment door and lowers his voice a bit. You hear light footsteps passing by the door and some folk music playing on the radio. We have our first preliminary identification. In all likelihood, the deceased is the husband of Billy Mijan. We need to confirm this, as well as deliver the death notification to Billy herself. Now, delivering a death notification is never an easy task. There's a reason why it's often called the most stressful part of our job. This is why it's usually done in pairs. You got this. I'll be monitoring reactions, ready to act if necessary. I mean, do you have any advice on how to tell her... Dead? Just don't say that you know how they feel. You don't. Okay, that's good advice. Uh, yeah, I think I'm ready. I'm not gonna bail on this. This is important. Hello? Who is it? A voice calls out from the other side of the door. And someone turns down the radio. Uh, this might be a little harsh. Right? <laughs> this sounds like I'm trying to serve a warrant or something. Uh, no, let's... I should speak up. 
just a moment. You hear shuffling inside. Tidying up. Nervously. There's fear in her voice. Come in, the door is open. Okay, let's go do a thing that's probably not going to be a tremendous amount of fun. <laughs> Listen, I'm not one of those people who's going to tell you video games have to be fun to be worthwhile, but I'm definitely not super looking forward to this interaction. Uh, the good news is we get to click on all these orbs. Empty pack of Red Astra cigarettes hidden under the bed. Hmm. Same brand of cigarettes you found in the trash next to the deceased. Why are they hidden under the bed? Windows covered in old newspaper clippings. Can't they afford curtains? No, I suspect they cannot. You just stay right there. Packages of hu humanitarian aid macaronis. Lo uh, leftovers kept warm on a stovetop. Smells like buckwheat and onions here. This is a weird thing for me to be doing. A chalk-drawn height chart for children's growth over the years. Posters of contemporary pop stars adorn the walls. Clock is ticking away with an odd cheerfulness. A textbook for high school. Mathematics. Trigonometry, mostly. And she desperately wants me to talk to her instead of just rummaging through her home. Um, I might not be wearing the appropriate clothes here. Uh, let's... Maybe... Drop the hat so as not to be um, down suggestion. I don't know. Suggestion's not going to be important here. Probably none of this really matters. This is not going to be an interaction where I have to do anything other than empathize. So I guess let's put on our empathy shoes. There we go. That's what empathy looks like right there. It's you from the book stand. Did you come to bring my cockatoo back? She smiles nervously before the smile vanishes from her face. I don't think I introduced myself properly. I'm Billy. Would you like something to drink? A tea, lemonade? We're out of coffee. The lieutenant has taken off his foggy glasses and is busy cleaning them in his handkerchief for now. You're on your own here. Great. He must feel vulnerable without his glasses. Is this why he's letting you take the lead? Um, th thanks, but I'm alright. We probably sh should not stay any longer than we have to. Is this about Victor, my husband? Is he in some kind of trouble again? I can pick him up in the station if that's what... She stops, her eyes trying to read answers from your face. Something changes in her expression. No, this is something much worse. Is he in a hospital? How, how bad is it? How about some small talk before you break the news? I don't think that that's a thing I should do. Uh, I'm extremely good at empathy, and I'm not going to roll a two. I'm just not going to do it. I think any of this is just cruel, right? Okay, he, d he doesn't roll the two. Okay, you've done this before. Just keep your focus. God, do I just say he's dead like that? I mean... An impossible success. God, look at how high our empathy skill is right now. Um. Shit. What, what do I do here? Yeah, I probably just tell her, right? Like, I'm, I'm trying to think of how I would react here. I wouldn't... I'd be upset about any kind of nonsense hemming and hawing done to cushion the blow. Just fucking tell me. Ma'am, I'm very sorry to say, but your husband, Victor Mijan, was found dead on the Martinez boardwalk. Wait, did I know his name was Victor? She blinks. What did you say? Your husband, Victor Mijan, is dead. I'm very sorry for your loss, ma'am. Oh. She touches her neck, eyes pale like pearls in seawater. Oh, she says again. But, but he was just... She looks at the kitchen table where two cigarette butts are still in the tray. But he was just here, alive. We understand this comes as a huge shock. I, I want you to know that me and my partner are here for you if you have any questions. Just take your time, ma'am. What happened to him? She turns to you. Her neck and cheeks are covered with red blotches. Her double chin is shaking. It was an accident. He fell through a hole in the boardwalk and hit his head. Was he drunk? Yes. 
I see. She withdraws, trying to picture the scene. And you just found him there, lying in the cold. How long had he been there? If you say two days, maybe, it will be etched in her mind forever. That's, uh... Well, it, it couldn't have been long. She blinks, eyes welling up with tears, as her hands start searching for something from the pockets of her dress. A handkerchief. Uh, yeah, no words, just give her the lieutenant's handkerchief. A small, terrified smile quivers on her face as she takes the handkerchief and wipes away the tears. She looks disoriented. Is there anyone we could call for you? A friend, a family member, someone who could be here for you? No, no, she breathes in. I just need to tell my girls. The air gets sucked out of her lungs suddenly. Oof, yeah... God, should I call them? Should I tell them to come home? No, take a day to recover. You'll be better prepared when they come home tomorrow. Good, that's that's probably the right thing. Thank you. She nods, but with a wretched expression. Just tell me, what do I need to do next? Where is he? Can I see him? We've taken him to the city morgue. The local coroner will be contacting you shortly to arrange the funeral. Here's his number, in case you want to contact him earlier. Very good call. He hands her a leaflet with the morgue's contact information. Is there anything else the RCM could do for you? No, I'll call you if something comes up. I I'm still... She rubs her face, runs her fingers over cheeks that have become numb. Thank you. She looks down. Thank you for telling me. I'll, I'll call if... She runs out of breath. Again, I'm very sorry, ma'am. The, the lieutenant nods at the woman, then looks back at you, his voice lowered. We should step outside and talk. Set the library card by her and leave the room. Yeah, that's... That's rough. That's a rough one. I mean, it's a thing that sometimes you're going to have to do, but that's... <sighs> the best of all of our bad options <laughs> in the terrible, terrible situation. Okay. Uh, the balcony feels cool and quiet, with a stunning view over the district. So, uh, what now? I'll call the station when we're finished with the day and let them know the name of the deceased. That's it? That's it. We should get back to our case now that our duty here is done. But what about Billy and her kids? They'll manage. They have to. It's not your place to live their lives. Right. This is closed, then. Okay. We did... We did good there. We did all the good that was available to do, I think. Just... Just a shitty situation. Well, shall we go and spoil the mood by talking to Kuno? I mean, we... With our empathy shoes on, we have a 58% chance of passing that check, and I am actually, like, I'm super curious what happens if you successfully empathize with Kuno. Maybe I'm I'm probably partially curious, because it's a thing that's been on our plate for such a very long time. I think I'm going to go for it. Maybe we could, uh, maybe we can have a big emotional victory here, and it can make me feel better <laughs> about the things that are happening. And then we do need to talk to Joyce... Um, we need to go down into the commercial area. You know what? I'm going to do that first. Let's go to the doomed commercial area because that's going to feel a little bit more triumphant. In the state I'm in right now, I think I would take morale damage if we failed the, the empathy check with Kuno one more time. So we can get in pretty easily through here. And then it's just a matter of hoping that the... Uh, what do you call it? I'm hoping that the, uh, the password is the same. God, look how empathic we are. Look at how incredibly goddamn empathic we are. This really is a very spooky thing here. There wasn't really a way in here that didn't cost us two loading screens, right? Because if we had tried to go through the bookshop, we still would have had to do the bookshop interior. Although... I also, yeah, I probably should have gone that way because I want to do something at the bookshop. 
Okay, insert the production schedule. Press play. Uh, let's try the password for the production schedule. Afterlife, death. Good, I've unlocked the production schedule. After ending the call, please press print to access the filament. Really? She just used the same password. The lieutenant seems almost disappointed to discover that, as he murmurs, Maybe those radio computer guys aren't that paranoid after all. Fortress accident, is there anything else I can do for you today? Oh no, thanks. That's That's been extremely helpful. Press print. With a quiet determination, the printer starts printing, a piece of paper unfolding like a handheld fan. A black crisscross of letters covers its surface. Let's have a look. It's a project report written by the lead producer Andrew Andy Schott about We're All Untethered, a radio game developed by the studio Fortress Accident. The first few pages give an overview of the capital and workforce, while the rest of it seems to be a production schedule. Gee, what a surprise. I mean, we should read about all of it, right? I want to know about this money. In its short time of existence, Fortress Accident SCA managed to burn through truly insane amounts of money. The first tranche of seed financing uh, brought in 150,000 real, but then came the delays. Eventually, the damage reached 400k, with only half of the game finished. Gosh, where did they get all this money? Let's just say it was a real adventure for their Egonian investor. Alright, who worked there and for how long? Fortress Accident employed 18 people, the bulk of the team composed of writers and concept artists. There were also radio programmers, sound engineers, a CEO, two marketing experts, and a single overburdened producer who developed a habit of popping Perholodon in the basement to escape his obligations. Why did Fortress Accident have so many concept artists? And why does a radio game need this many artists? It didn't. It, it didn't need so many concept artists? Oh no, definitely not! A few more producers could have come in handy, though, especially when dealing with writers, some of whom routinely skipped work because of mental health issues and extremely unprofessional sleep schedules. One of them even managed to steal some valuable company property before skipping town for good. Alright, let's skim through the uh, production schedule here. The production schedule depicts their glorious descent into bankruptcy, because of the concept artists. Uh, no, not the concept artists. It wasn't even the writers with their panic attacks and three-hour lunches. It was impossible not to fail. The project was too large, and no amount of money could satiate the ever-expanding ambitions of the development team. Ah, yes, that killer of all great, great games, Scope Creep. They tried to make a 4 million real game with 400,000 in their bank account. They thought they could bridge the gap with pure willpower and imagination. They couldn't. Ah, so they were done in by their own ambition. No, even then, success remained within an ever-narrowing margin of possibility that, despite everything, never entirely disappeared. That is, until they discovered the Valley of the Heads. The what? At the eleventh hour, the lead designer, Zemsk-born Sulislav Zavisa, maybe Zavisha? decided that what Whirl Untethered needed was a secret mystical location at the extreme edge of the map. The place was to be the Valley of the Heads, where the heads of all the headless constructs could be found. The player would have been able to choose a head for their headless party member, and each head would have been voiced on air by a professional actor. What? This is insane! <laughs> How many heads were there? Hold on. So many. At last count, there were approximately 10,000 heads for 10,000 headless men all of which could be endlessly recombined. But how many combinations could you make out of that? Do you really want to know? There seems to be a calculation here, but it may take a while. You know what? Yes. How bad could it be? That. That is how bad, apparently. That doesn't seem right to me. Okay. Just, just running some numbers here real quick. Kim, hold on a second. Keep going. I want another full number. I need to see it all. Yeah, this is there's some real like pareidolia going on here. The, your brain seeing patterns in the numbers as they fly past, like an illustration, and it's driving me crazy that it doesn't quite seem to be anything. There's almost like a magic eye puzzle going on. The lieutenant taps his foot impatiently, his arms folded tight against his chest. Hey, I'm busy, Kim. Hold on, this is important. 
God, look at all these sixes. Have you ever seen so many sixes? Keep going, obviously. This is not correct. <laughs> this is the wrong number. And this calculation shouldn't really be that hard, I wouldn't think. Oh no! I failed an interfacing check. What if you broke the radio computer? What if it's never going to stop? No, man, just let the numbers wash over you. Uh-oh. And that's it. Okay, so that's what did them in. Well, yeah, that and the catastrophic data loss. Ah, uh, this must be the anomaly Suna mentioned in the church log. On the nature of the data loss, there's ominously little information in the production log. It comes at the very end, where things get fuzzy and dark, where tables and numbers seem to vanish into an eerie nothingness, before their Egonian investor, investor pulled the plug. What is clear is that one day an unidentified numeric anomaly occurred on the East Rovisholian lintel front, just as the Whirl Untethered project was being computed that day. And the anomaly caused all that data to just get lost in the air? When the project was returned, it was completely blank. The team spent weeks on the phone with Lintel, the service provider, but despite their diagnostics, they could never produce a satisfactory explanation or pay for the loss. Well, wasn't there a copy of the game, like a backup somewhere? Mysteriously enough, it seems the off-site copy happened to be on-site when the catastrophic data loss occurred. It was the lead programmer's responsibility to oversee weekly maintenance of the off-site copy and, well, keep it off-site. An explanatory note from the lead programmer has been attached. Uh, the lead programmer of Fortress Accident, the off-site copy was on-site because there was no off-site anymore. Not for me, not after eight months of crunch. I didn't have a home anymore, so I started keeping it in the basement in the Ice Bear refrigerator near where I went to sleep. It was perfectly safe there. The temperature conditions were optimal. Huh. That seems like a perfectly reasonable explanation. That's not what her colleagues thought. Is there anything else from the lead programmer? The production schedule ends with a few random notes that seem to be added sometime later. We'll obviously read them. Four months later, by an unknown author... I am the only one left, and it's gotten rather damp here. A few other businesses have gone under, too. Slipstream switched to making skis, and the hairdressers just left cursing Martinez. They're right, though. Something's seriously wrong with this place. Martinez, all of it. Still haven't gotten an answer from Lintel about what happened. All I could get were the physical coordinates of that of the error on the East Insulindian front on that day. Since the computation happened on air, I reckoned it had to coincide with an actually existing location. I have compared the coordinates to a map of Rivishol West. Turns out it's only 800 meters from here. The address is St. Brune, 1147. I'm going there, to look this thing in the eye. Well, that's what the street sign next to the church says. Okay, tear off the printout and throw it away. I think we got all of the information we're ever going to get here. May as well keep this, though. Well, that was interesting. Did we not have... Okay. thought we had a, a task for that. Did, did it get completed? I guess I want to look at the done thing here. Uh, dead body on boardwalk. No, it did. If we had a task, it did not get completed. It would have been in Tuesday stuff. No, well, maybe it was never officially a task. Huh. Okay. I really thought it was. I mean, it felt pretty important to me. Hold on. Kim wants to talk. Okay. What do you think is going on? that computer, chalkboard, and fireplace. Uh, well, I mean, it's obvious. This is what remains of Suna's radio game studio, Fortress Accident. Yes, I got that. The lieutenant shifts on his feet. What I meant was, what were they trying to achieve with this damn game? What were their ambitions? Because this here looks rather advanced. He has respect and curiosity for this failed endeavor. This is way above your tiny little policeman head. Aw. I might have been able to pass that. We might have three points of conceptualization clothing. Man, I don't know. I'm not an artist. Okay. Well, I think... The lieutenant takes a step back, steepling his hands. Like he's ready to lay out a fine theory, crafted together like a puzzle box. It looks like one of those popular pen and paper role-playing games. Only these people were trying to automate it. Make it work on radio computers. 
How are they planning to do that? Through call-in stations. He nods at the fireplace. None of the players have to be physically present. Anyone in the world can participate in the game as long as they have a two-way radio. Then there's the Game Master frequency that listens in on the smaller call-in stations. I think that was supposed to coordinate the stories, functioning as a master of ceremonies of sorts. Coordinating so many games would take a whole switchboard of people, possibly divided into sub-frequencies. Has anyone ever done this before? No, I have a feeling the answer to this is, uh, is no. Not to my knowledge. They make automated games in Grad, Messina, Konigstein, you know, places with industry. Not in Revishal West among the ruins. But I don't think anyone has attempted to create an inter isolary game before. We just don't have the technology. And this was a role-playing game. Indeed, those Welkins are a dead giveaway, he points to the chalkboard. Role-playing people love that stuff. The world looks like a modified version of the We're All board game, with heat death thrown in. Super cool. Someone should give them millions of real immediately. This game is too good to be left unfinished. Wow. Indeed, it's ambitious and untethered from reality, but the lieutenant tilts his head, thinking. Uh... <laughs> Let's finish it. That feels a little ambitious. Okay, this is maybe true. I don't believe this. Our character might believe this. The, <laughs> the curse got them. I see no other explanation for why this insanely ambitious thing would fail. Uh, I kind of want to say one of these bottom two, though. I think like the, there's a magic to this that we'd have a hard time letting go of. I mean, the world is cold and lonely. This would keep it company. Let's finish it. A half-smile breaks out on his face. It's too late for that, I'm afraid, he says, looking around in the derelict room. The pipes howl and a rat crosses the floor. Okay, he concludes. Let's keep moving. Well, hopefully he at least thinks that there was, uh, you know, he sees that there was a noble idea behind me wanting to do that. Even if it was a completely crazy thing to say. But that is probably a good place to leave off for today. You know, we are solving mysteries left and right here. I'm feeling very accomplished. Uh, come back next time tomorrow to see if we can hold up that streak. And we'll see you then.